Hi there, and welcome to this episode of Whiteboard Wednesday. A few episodes ago, we talked about, or one of the other episodes, we've talked about the difference between temporary or term life insurance and permanent life insurance. And so I want to explain today the, the difference between basically two types of permanent life insurance that you see out there. There's kind of variations on a theme on the one side, which I'll explain, but real the reality is there's there's only two types of insurance. We talked about term and permanent. And today I just want to talk about the permanent side and what the differences are there. For many years, I've explained universal life, which is something that most of you will have heard of. I've explained universal life as a car and a trailer, as opposed to another insurance product, permanent insurance product, cash value life insurance or whole life is the name it was given years and years ago as a pickup truck. So I'm not going to try and draw a car in a trailer because it's going to look really bad. So I'm going to draw two containers, if you will. So if this is universal life, you have an insurance component and you have an investment component. So I'm kind of going backwards in time because years ago, Universal Life, back in the 80s, mid 80s, Universal Life was invented. And it was actually invented because at the time, there was some very negative publicity uh, brought in by a company out of the US about whole life insurance. And they were saying, buy term and invest the difference. That whole life was a ripoff, that it wasn't good value for people. And so they were encouraging people to by term life insurance, which we explained last time as life insurance that is just like renting, the, you're only paying for the death benefit and the cost goes up over time. And at retirement age, it ends. You just can't keep it any longer. And so it gets more and more expensive over time. The premise was that you would buy that term life insurance and invest the difference that you would have put into a whole life policy and you'd end up with far more cash at the end. That was the premise. Reality is that it isn't how people think and that often isn't how people live. So universal life was essentially created at that time to unbundle, hence the explanation of car and trailer versus pickup truck, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment here, unbundle the death benefit or the insurance part and the cash or growth part of the policy. The reason this is important, one of the reasons this is important is because cash that grows in a life insurance policy does so on a tax-free basis. In another video, we'll talk about the difference between owning life insurance on a personal basis and owning it in the corporation. But today I just want to talk about the differences between universal life and whole life, which are their product names and how they work. So universal life is an unbundled whole life product, basically. And so what's happened is you have the insurance piece and you've attached a cash value piece or an investment piece. What the insurance companies did when they invented this type of policy, and it's still around today and, and is used widely in various applications, is that they passed on the risk of investment to the policy owner. So the, the money that grows in here, you as a client ultimately are responsible for that investment. Now, you're given various mutual fund choices and that sort of thing so that your advisor will help you figure out what the investment options should look like. But essentially, the return of that fund will be simply the, the mutual fund you've chosen or group of mutual funds you've chosen or whatever it might be. It could be a GIC type option, very low risk. Uh, but also very low return, or it could be more mutual fund type of options. So let's say the insurance cost here on this universal life policy is $100 a month, just for argument's sake. It depends on age and the amount of insurance, as you would understand. But let's say the insurance cost is $100. Well, based on the insurance cost of $100, probably you could put into this trailer or the side fund that's attached to it, you could probably put in maybe 250 or $300 a month. So let's just say it's $300. Again, it depends on age, but 
that the ratio is is going to be pretty close depending uh, you know for most situations so you're paying hundred dollars a month for the insurance cost and you're investing 300 a month into the side fund and it's growing in that uh, in that trailer the money that grows inside a life insurance policy in Canada grows tax-free and so now your total premium per month is $400 a month. 100 is paying for the insurance cost, which there's various ways to structure the premium cost, but let's just for argument's sake say that it's a level, it's based on a level cost, okay? So the, the premium is, is level cost, and then whatever's in the side fund gets paid out in addition to the death benefit that was originally purchased or the insurance amount that was originally purchased. So let's say the original amount was 250,000. And over time, that 300 a month or approximately, well, 3,600 a year grows with interest. And after 10 years, let's say there's another uh, 50,000 of cash in that policy. That 50,000, if death occurred at that time, would get paid out in addition to the original amount of insurance. So the total payout would be $300,000 at that point. The other interesting thing about this cash that builds in that side fund or the trailer as I've termed it, is that that allows the person to stop paying premiums out of pocket at some point in the future. So if premiums are $1,200 a year, or hundred bucks a month, and the person's put in an extra 36,000 plus interest. I'm, I'm saying maybe it's 50,000 at that point, it might be more than that. They can at that point, they can stop putting this money into the policy and allow that 50,000, the, the, the money that's in that trailer, to pay the insurance cost. Because the thing about permanent life insurance, the insurance cost has to be paid every year in, in this situation. That $100 has to come from somewhere. So it either comes out of pocket or it comes out of that trailer or that, that side fund, that, in, that investment fund. If a few years later the interest had kept up and you know maybe it, it had drawn down on that a little bit, but they're no longer paying that premium, then maybe they've got 250,000 plus, you know, maybe there's 15,000 left in the contract. Then at that point, 265,000 would be paid out as, uh, as a death benefit. So universal life has a lot of utility from a flexibility point of view, because you can decide to, the reason it's a car and a trailer or two boxes in my illustration here, is that you can decide just to pay the $100 a month. So you could have this trailer there, but not have anything in it. It gives you the flexibility to be able to add cash to pay that 400 or to pay somewhere between 100 and 400 if that's the maximum. The reason there's a maximum is that there's a limit as to how much you can sock away and have it grow tax free. The government, uh, the tax rules say that you can't, in other words, you can't pay $100 a month and put 100,000 into this, into this tax free account and have it grow tax free. There has to be, there's a correlation between how much you can put away and the premium that you're paying. So, but if that's the case, uh, if you didn't want to put money in there, and a lot of times that happens, people just make this a pay as you go. They just pay $100 a month and they just pay that forever. They just keep paying that insurance premium and at some point down the road, the premium is guaranteed level cost. Some point down the road, that 250,000 is going to pay out, which is, a lot of times what people choose as they get into or close to retirement age and they've owned they've owned term life insurance for their whole life up to that point they don't want to just have term life insurance because the cost is getting extremely high so sometimes they'll take a little bit lower amount or sometimes a lot lower amount of life insurance but have it uh, level cost and it's always going to be there so I'm going to wipe off this board and I'm going to tell you about whole life cash value insurance and you'll see the difference. 
Okay, so continuing on, as you see, I've wiped off the board. It's nice and clean. I just want to talk about, I, I talked a little bit about the, the car and the trailer analogy to explain universal life. Now I want to talk about cash value insurance or whole life insurance as it's been called over the years. So I mentioned at the beginning that it's like a pickup truck. So in the same way, a car and a trailer is two distinct vehicles going down the road, but you can see they're two distinct parts rather of, of one, uh, one vehicle. A pickup truck is obviously all in one. You can't really take it apart. And so that's exactly what whole life insurance is like. You've got an insurance component and you've got a cash component, an investment component, and it's built in. Now you might remember a minute ago, I was talking about how the life insurance uh, with universal life, the premium might've been $100 a month for the insurance cost, and then you could add 300 a month into the uh, side fund, into the trailer. Well, if it's whole life, if it's equivalent, let's just pretend it is for now, your premium is going to be 400 a month. You don't have the choice of paying less, like paying just the $100. You don't have the choice of paying $250 a month and have 100 go to insurance cost and 150 go in the trailer. It's, it's a package. So just like a pickup truck is one vehicle, whole life insurance is one vehicle. Now, you could say that that's a disadvantage because you don't get to choose just to pay the death benefit portion, or pardon me, the insurance cost portion, and then add the uh, cash value portion if you want to. But the advantage is that it builds up some pretty significant, significant cash over the lifetime of the contract. Now, this number that I'm using at 400 a month, with some of our corporate clients, because they've got large estate needs, this number might be 4,000 a month. It might be $100,000 a year. It might be uh, numbers even larger than that, depending on what they're trying to accomplish from an estate planning point of view. Talk about that in another Whiteboard Wednesday. But here we have whole life insurance where you have the insurance cost embedded with the cash value. Now, the difference is here between this and universal life. In addition to the fact that you've got an entire team of portfolio managers that manage that fund, so you, it's, not, it's not a mutual fund, it's actually an in-house managed PAR account, participating account, because the reason they call it that is because people who own whole life policies participate in the earnings of the company. So you participate in the profit and the profit goes into a segregated pool. I do this because it's like a big bowl or it's a, you know, it's a big um, container of all those whole life policies and all the dividends get reinvested back into that pool. They pay claims out of there, premiums come into there and that's essentially, it's, it's essentially run as a, as a completely separate trust. That's really important because Back in the 90s, in 1994, Confederation Life, who I worked for at the time, uh, actually declared bankruptcy. And so, you know, when a, when a company, a, a, life, a Canadian life insurance company declares bankruptcy, everybody gets nervous because, wow, you know, I paid all these premiums. Am I going to get any benefits out of my, out of my policy? Nobody lost a nickel. All the policy benefits were paid to all the policyholders. And eventually the, the business got bought up by other companies. And so, but the interesting thing is, is that the PAR account, the whole life policies that Confederation Life had at the time, because they're a segregated pool, they were not impacted by the, uh, the fallout of the bankruptcy of the company itself. Every dollar was saved, it didn't get dipped into, and it simply moved. It's like you, you, you take this, uh, this, container of, of policies and investments and all of that, this whole par policy bit. You unplug it from one institution and you, you sell it and you plug it into another one and it just keeps running. So there's a lot of safety built into that and there's a lot of safety built into the Canadian life insurance system as well. But another key is that when dividends are paid, dividends are, in this context, 
are simply a return of unused premium. That's literally what they are. So if we could say that uh, you know, you're getting charged 400 a month, I'll use the same example as I did before, for 250,000 of life insurance uh, at, that, at that time, uh, then you know, for, for term life insurance, maybe it costs you, depending on your age, maybe it costs you $25 a month. Well, that's a big difference. <laughs> that's quite a big difference. But what's happening is that 25, if it's term, goes up and up and up and up to the point where it's far higher than 400 a month later on in life. So what they do with whole life is they take that additional money that you're giving them over, over and above what they need to handle the risk, if you want to say it that way, and they invest that money. And that uh, means that at the end of each year, there's a dividend. It's a return of unused premium. And so that dividend does a few things. It buys more life insurance, so that 250 will grow, will, it'll go up over time. It buys more life insurance, it has cash value, and the returns are vested. What that means is as soon as a dividend is paid, it's guaranteed. That's the new floor for the next year. A lot of people don't understand that. Universal Life doesn't have those guarantees. Whatever the fund does, it, it does. They have guarantees, Universal Life has guarantees on the cost of insurance side, but they don't have guarantees on the returns. So the PAR account is really important. How it's managed is really important. And the other thing that a PAR account has is uh, mortality credits. So as people live longer and more premiums get paid into that pot, it simply improves the experience of the, of the pool and that, that's another story for another day, but that comes back to underwriting. If the underwriting is done well, then that impacts positively on the PAR account over an extended period of time. So there's a lot of guarantees and predictability, I like to say, built into a cash value life insurance policy. One of the biggest ones, and this is especially true for our corporate clients, which maybe we'll delve into in another one in more detail, um, is that the money grows tax-free. And when you have a corporation, you want that money to grow tax-free because any investment income in a corporation is taxed at 50% dollar one. So whether you own a whole life policy personally or corporately, it has a lot of utility from the perspective of growing money on a tax-free basis, paying it out on a tax-free basis, and then of course uh, other, other uses such as deriving a retirement income from, which we'll explore another time. So there is a difference between universal life, car in a trailer, and whole life, which is like the pickup truck, everything's together in one. But with whole life, there isn't necessarily a, a huge downside to it because you have a lot more predictability. It depends on your needs, it depends on what you want to accomplish, and you have to work that out with us or someone else as your advisor to figure out exactly what you need. So that's the difference between Whole life and universal life. Universal life being the car and the trailer, whole life being the pickup truck. And if you have questions, just let us know. Thanks for watching today.